Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor presented by ProScan Imaging Education Foundation. And in this series on the hip and impingement syndrome, this vignette is going to try and make some sense out of maybe nonsense. The literature is littered with different descriptors and subtypes of impingement syndrome. And while it's possible to categorize impingement syndrome, there are a few methods of categorization. So let's begin. And um, the, first, the first slide demonstrates two major differences, not the only differences, but two major differences between cam impingement on the left and pincer impingement. In cam impingement, many, but not all of the cases, are associated with alteration in the transition from the head to the neck so that the normal graceful tapering that occurs between the two is lost and a bump ensues. That bump could be developmental, it can be acquired. So that that bump in certain positions like hip flexion rams into the anterosuperior labrum and creates problems. In pincer impingement, the problem is more often, but not exclusively, acetabular. The acetabulum may be overgrown. It may be too deep so that the head appears sucked in. As a result, in certain positions, portions of the labrum, for, for instance, the anterior wall of the labrum, may then rake against the normally tapered neck and create osteoedema, and various other manifestations. We'll see that there are other ways to categorize impingement syndrome. This long, extensive anterior labrum combined with a not shown overgrown posterior labrum may produce a pincer phenomenon analogous to a crab claw. Now let's try and make some sense of it all. This is a, a diagram developed by uh, Tanast, presented in the American Journal of Radiology in 2007, and it shows how pincer impingement is more of an excessive acetabular coverage phenomenon, whereas cam-type impingement is more often a femur, especially a femur neck phenomenon where there is loss of the sphericity of the femoral head as it transitions to the neck. In other words, the neck is too wide or bumpy, thus the osseous bump. And then one sees some other descriptors associated with cam-type impingement, things like retrotorsion, which we're not going to talk about today, coxa vera, in which the hip is angled in at the level of the shaft, the pistol grip deformity, which we'll show you today, and anterosuperior preferential labral pathology, which is common with this constellation of findings. On the other hand, in pincer type impingement, it can be generalized or it can be focal. If it's focal, one wall may be overdeveloped. For instance, if it's the anterior wall of the acetabulum, then the femoral head is pushed backwards. It's rotated backwards. This is called acetabular retroversion. If the posterior wall is too prominent, it may be too inferior or too deep. Sometimes it may rotate the head forward. This is known as antiversion. In general forms of pincer type impingement, you may see a cup that's too deep, the trusio acetabuli with overcoverage, or coxa profunda, a subject we won't cover today. Another way to divide up FAI, or femoroacetabular impingement, is by extrinsic versus intrinsic etiologies. Well, I think you know what we mean by extrinsic. You can divide extrinsic down into femoral causes and acetabular causes. And you can further subdivide these into those that are primary and secondary. In other words, developmental, long-standing, or secondary or acquired. The same thing 
on the acetabular side. Most of you are wondering, what's intrinsic mean? There's nothing underneath our chart for intrinsic, but let's take an example. Let's suppose you have a loose body of some size in the inferior aspect of the joint. And that loose body in certain positions, let's say leg flexion or knee flexion, pushes the femoral head up by the very nature of its mass effect. It just displaces it. So it drives the femoral head in leg flexion into the acetabular roof. You have an intrinsic problem in the joint, a mass that is producing abnormal displacement in certain positions. This could also happen if you rupture the ligamentum teres, and the ligamentum teres forms a ball in the dependent portion of the joint due to gravity. We can also divide up FAI, not into cam and pincer types, but simply by which bony elements are the dominant abnormalities. You can have a femoral dominant or an acetabular dominant cause. Now we already know that acetabular dominant causes are associated with pincer impingement. Femur type causes are associated with cam type impingement. And with each of these, the classic associated abnormalities include loss of the normal tapered neck. When the neck is really fat on one side, this is called the pistol grip deformity. Another name given to this is femoral waist deficiency. In other words, when the femur comes in, it doesn't make a nice, delicate waist. It stays rather broad. And then you've already heard about some of the pincer manifestations. Acetabular protrusion, in other words, a cup that's too deep, or an anterior wall of the acetabulum that is too long, forcing the femoral head backwards, rotating it backwards, so-called acetabular retroversion. Drilling into the femoral causes, which are associated with cam-type impingement, there is also a subgroup that is more likely to be affected with this femoral category. They're usually younger, athletic individuals that flex their leg with internal rotation. They may have some of the positive impingement or FAI signs on physical examination. They often do not feel comfortable bringing the knee up towards the chin, internally rotating the leg or adducting the leg, crossing one leg in front of the other. In summarizing, both visually and in text, some of the findings of FAI1, a more femur-based type of impingement, also known as type 1 impingement. One sees the normal appearance of the acetabulum and hyaline cartilage and then the impacted portion in various positions, especially in knee flexion and varying degrees of internal rotation. The primary abnormality described, but not the only abnormality, is loss of the normal delicate transition from the head to the neck so that a bump forms and the bump then comes in contact with these structures. So let's summarize in textual format the findings. An abrasion or avulsion of the acetabular cartilage due to this impaction depicted here in orange. An anterosuperior rim labral tear. Occasionally, a hypertrophic piece of bone may break off, a so-called ossicle, a bump. Friction associated with the bump may produce a pseudocyst or an intraosseous ganglion, also known as a pit. Some people call this the bump cyst complex. There may be deformities in the neck. The neck's too broad. The patient may have had a history of slip capital femoral epiphysis. One may see the pistol grip deformity, fracture deformities, loss of sphericity of the femoral head, 
so that now that sphericity is interrupted. There also may be insufficiency of the acetabular coverage. In pincer impingement, there's overcoverage, too much coverage. In cam type impingement or type 1, there's insufficient coverage. And occasionally, you'll even see the femoral head pushed forward, so called antiversion. Whereas it's more common to see the femoral head pushed backwards in pincer type impingement, so called retroversion. So in our next vignette, we'll re-review some of these findings very briefly and then transition to what happens to the labrum in FAI. See you then.